Well, I'd now like to talk about a food web that doesn't have its own primary producers. How does this food web get energy? Well, of course, it imports it from another ecosystem. This would be the midwater food webs. Midwater food webs exist at the middle depths in the world ocean. And they're an important food web in terms of carbon cycling. And ultimately, they're the food web that determines how much carbon makes it down to the seafloor. Midwater food webs depend on a rain of phytoplankton produced food from above. So all the, thi all the things we learned about the pelagic food webs living up in the photic zone, all the food, all the processes that affect the rates at which phytoplankton produce organic matter, will affect the midwater food web as well. Literally, it depends on those times at which phytoplankton are producing lots of food, and as that food sinks down out of the photic zone into the midwater food webs, that's when the midwater food web gets going. And as I've said before, they play an important role in the exchange of carbon between surface waters and the seafloor. So as midwater food webs process food, if they're very efficient at processing that food, they pretty much leave all the carbon in the upper ocean. They, they prevent carbon from sinking down and removing carbon from the atmosphere. If, on the other hand, midwater food webs are not very efficient, then some of that carbon slips down to the seafloor and gets buried. Of course, there's organisms down at the bottom as well that are processing carbon. But once carbon gets down to the seafloor and ultimately gets put into sediments and tucked away for tens if not hundreds of thousands of years, it's out of the atmosphere and can't cause greenhouse warming. So it's an important food web in modern day studies for trying to determine the role of the ocean in climate. The midwater food web looks something like this, and you actually saw a figure like this when we talked about the nitrogen cycle. You saw a figure like this when we talked about vertical migration and the carbon cycle and those kinds of things. But again, this is the type of figure that's more illustrative to kind of have you follow through the different kinds of processes and think about controls on the midwater food web in terms of its sources of food and what it does with that food. We can actually start with talking about the euphotic zone food web, the pelagic ocean food web, again, driven by phytoplankton. As phytoplankton are eaten, their fecal pellets of the zooplankton sink down into the midwater depths. Phytoplankton may also sink of their own accord or as they die into midwater depths. And it's here in these midwater depths where these bits and pieces of either fecal pellets or even uh, dead, dying, and decaying um, phytodetritus may be eaten and egested and ingested and egested and fragmented and processed in a number of different ways. And of course, physical processes like mixing or turbulence will also determine the rate at which these particles are fragmented or brought down into the deeper, um, into deeper depths. Of course, vertical migrations as organisms rise from these midwater depths to feed at night and then sink back down, that's going to have an important uh, effect on the processing of this material and where it ultimately is distributed in the world ocean. And if you remember in chapter 13, we talked about the vertical migrators and being one of the largest animal migrations on our planet, and it happens every night. This food also, this food web also gives rise to something called marine snow, which are really just flocks and little pieces of organic matter that sink down as well. And there's various organisms that will eat this marine snow. There's various organisms that eat the fecal pellets of zooplankton, a, a phenomenon called coprophagy. So one man's fecal pellet is another man's food in the midwater food webs. There are some types of gelatinous organisms that can actually filter out very fine particles. So all the different kinds of ecological interactions with organisms feeding on different kinds of particles um, or feeding on the waste of different particles, as well as the kind of predator-prey relationships that of course are very important in the midwater food webs are going to be happening here as well. And it's a good time to think about the chapter uh, in chapter 13, how we learned about bioluminescence. It's in the midwater food webs in this twilight zone and in, in the bathypelagic zone where bioluminescence is an important process, an important phenomenon for organisms to either 
attract prey or to prevent from being eaten. Of course, bacteria play an important role as well in the midwater food webs. So all these things that we've really talked about previously are going on in the midwater food web. They're just going in, on in the dark beneath the photic zone. And again, the main take home message here is that how much carbon gets sent down to the seafloor is going to be an important role and an important understanding for oceanographers as we try to figure out what the ocean is doing in terms of the carbon cycle and try to figure out the role of the ocean in controlling carbon dioxide in the atmosphere.